Good morning. Good morning. If you were in grammar school with someone you're attending this reunion, would you please stand up? Now what about these three gentlemen in the third row? All three stand up. Now who stole whose points? Anybody steal it? You went to grammar school together first? Wow. You learn something every day. Please be seated. Hope you all are having a good time. Anybody go to Friday on the Hill last night? Yeah. Yes. Right. How was the food? Yeah. Well, I'm in charge of the weather this morning. And <laughs> yeah, Mr. Bedour is going to take care of the rest of the weekend. <laughs> I've been blamed for uh, global warming, as a matter of fact. <laughs> this is a program that began before I arrived in this role, it was in 19, spring of 1982, then called Saturday Morning, it was called Saturday Morning Chapel Hill. It was a takeoff on Charles Burrell Sunday morning. And actually in 1982, for the inaugural one, Charles Burrell participated. In the intervening years, we've had a number of formats. Uh, there was one or two occasions where we had a contest between the debate team in the 25th reunion class for the student team. And we doctored the question so that the student team did not prevail. Uh, uh, several years ago, we launched with Raleigh Tillman uh, the format that you're going to experience this morning. And what we found is that it's a recurring one that's so well received because it allows both alumni and students to learn from one another. And I can assure you, the students are going to hear some things that will surprise them, as will the alumni, including things like how they got to Chapel Hill or how often they used the library, things like that. Uh, to moderate and facilitate, we found someone who has a little bit of experience around here in a variety of roles. Uh, from student affairs to undergraduate admissions to law school, to athletic department, athletic director, and um, I'm going to just say, please welcome Vicki Bedour. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Doug. Good morning. Can you hear me okay? I, I, I don't feel like this microphone is working, is it? I, I don't think I need it except your 50th anniversary, the hearing goes, I get it. Well, um, this is all about fun this morning and I will certainly give you enough time to ask the panelists, especially uh, some of the students, uh, your questions about current life in Chapel Hill. So we're, we're going to talk about some differences and we're going to talk about some things that are really very much the same. Saturday classes, no Saturday classes. Why court, which is where your center of activity was, the pit. La Pizza, a hundred places to buy pizza. Ratscala, top of the hill. Weegens, flip-flops. Khakis in a Madras shirt, what's a Madras shirt? <laughs> And of course, now I can say, Silent Sam. No Silent Sam. There are some things that are going to be the same. Terrific faculty, oh well, Bell Tower, but more importantly, the guts of the institution. But here to talk about all of this is a distinguished panel. And so what I'm going to ask them to do, now don't mess this up, I want to give you your name, your hometown, your major, if you had one, <laughs> and uh, the students, if you'll take them in your hometown and where you're living now, and then if the students can talk, if you have plans for after, after you graduate. Now, panelists, we got a lot to cover. So this is the only thing you're going to be graded on today. <laughs> Precise, concise answers, okay? Fred, we'll start with you. Name, hometown, major. Uh, good morning. Okay. Fred Coster. 
hometown was Charleston, South Carolina. Currently live in Alexandria, Virginia. My major was history, mostly Middle East history. And uh, live in Craig. And I'm sorry, what we, in your career was in the Air Force? Oh, I, I, spent, I didn't say, yeah. Uh, 38 plus years in the Air Force, active duty and reserve. And as a civilian, I worked at the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, Natural, natural Gas Pipeline Process. Thank you, Fred. And panelists, you do not have to stand up. It should be comfortable. That's good. Charlie, would you give Joanne that microphone? Uh, Okay, if you like. <laughs> this is what I do, actually. I'm Joanne Wilson. I'm a gastroenterologist over at Duke, uh, class of 69. I was a BS chem major from Raleigh. I now actually live in Chapel Hill, but have lived a bunch of other places, but have been here about 30 years. Uh, I'm faculty at Duke. <laughs> no, no thumbs up. Uh, and um, I see patients and teach uh, faculty, students, lay people and national faculty interactions. Thank oh. you. Yeah, okay. I'm Charlie Mercer. I'm the son of a Methodist minister, so I was born in Wilmington to live several places. I call my hometown Smithfield. That's where I went to high school. I live in Raleigh, North Carolina. I'm a lawyer. At Chapel Hill, I major in political science. Thank you, Charlie. Jean, could you take, yeah. Good morning. I'm Jean Neville. I, um, my hometown is Raleigh, North Carolina. I live in the southern part of Atlanta and have for 50 years since graduation, which has been wonderful. I majored in education, uh, got my master's here as well, and have been able to have a wonderful experience um, starting the school for students with learning disabilities and attention deficit disorder in Durham called the Hill Center. And uh, happy to be here today. Thank you, Gene. You can hold that one, Gene, and you use the other. Use the, there you go. Um, my name is Elizabeth Brooks. I will be a junior in the fall. I'm from Swansboro, North Carolina. I'm an exercise and sports science major and a chemistry minor on the pre-pharmacy track. And That's good. Okay. Thank you. Hi, I'm Corey Dean. Um, I am from Eflin, North Carolina, which is about 20 minutes north of here in Orange County. Um, I'm a journalism major with minors in Southern Studies and History. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, my name is Erin Lewis. I'm a rising senior from Washington, North Carolina. I'm double majoring in human development and family studies through the School of Education at the for Science. Um, when I graduate, I want to go to Teach for America and then go to law school for some public Hi everyone, my name is Lenore Hango. I am also a rising senior from right here in Chapel Hill. I am majoring in health policy and management, which is through our School of Public Health. I have a minor in chemistry, but I'm not pre-med. And when I graduate, I will probably be working at the intersection of business and healthcare, either through consulting or at a startup. Thank you. This is the first time we've uh, ever, we've not had a mail from the student side. So one of you, if you get, we get that question, you're going to have to represent the male side of things. <laughs> All right, so I want everybody to answer this um, quickly if you can. How did you communicate with your parents? How was that actually done? How often was it done? And, uh, and kind of how, how did those conversations go? So Fred, we'll start down. You, you'll go first. And use the microphone, please. And you can just sit. It's, how I seem to remember uh, communicating with my parents. Tr try it this way. Long distance phone calls. There you go. Yeah. And the mail. Snail mail, as they call it now. There was no internet, of course, and no cell phones. So you called them on the phone. Right. And where was the phone? Uh, in the, uh, I guess you could call it the lobby on that. Second floor of Craig Dorm. Okay, and how long how long did that conversation usually last? Maybe ten minutes. Ten minutes, okay. Joanne, thank you. Though I was from Raleigh, it was pretty close. I didn't go home until Thanksgiving. Uh, I phoned uh, intermittently. The phone calls were usually pretty short, and wrote some letters to friends and from to my grandmother mainly. I called my parents. 
And it would be the same here, talking on the phone. You had a hall phone in your dormitory. And uh, using snail mail, it cost six cents back then. <laughs> 50 cents now, but nobody uses it much. So basically phone and then uh, going home some of the weekends. Okay. And being from Raleigh, also, it was not that big a deal in terms of space, but I don't believe, I don't come anymore. They didn't be there. Holidays were a big deal. Um, we had a phone at the end of the hall, so that was a big deal that we had to share. And we had to, you know, take more than a few minutes because that was the only source of communication to the outside world. And my dad used to write me letters a lot. And it was, it was a sweet way for us to exchange um, communication and uh, it was usually a, a little pep talk and keep up your grades, but um, always a sweet note. Did, 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 just, did you ever hear your dad in the background saying to your mom, get off that phone, this is long distance? <laughs> no, we didn't talk that long. <laughs> okay, so Elizabeth, you go. Um, I am able to call my parents on my cell phone, thankfully. Um, I text my mom a lot. I know freshman year, I would call her like every day because it was a big transition and I had never really been away from home that long and so I was calling her for advice or just to hear her voice and tell her about my day. And then sophomore year, I probably did not call her as much as I should have, <laughs> but they still love me. And I did call my mom yesterday, so that's what counts. <laughs> yes. Um, I don't really call my mom that much. Um, that's just like not our relationship, I guess. But we do have a family group message that we keep up and we like send funny memes or like what happened during our day. Um, so I would say like I, I probably text her every day, not necessarily like, to tell her what I'm doing, but just like, hey, I'm thinking of you. So yeah, I talk to you know, one or both of my parents pretty much every day, whether it's like a phone call or a video call or a text message. Um, we're just talking about the group chat, and I only live two hours and two minutes away from home, at least probably once a month. Um, I mean, I'm just going to echo what my fellow students have said. Um, I will also say that I'm from Chapel <coughs> Hill, so I go home probably more frequently than most of you. But I like home cooking meals and a lot of So, Jean, this is a question for Jean and Charlie for. Aaron and Corey, what did your parents know about the actual courses that you were taking and the grades that you made in those actual courses? Yeah. Well, first of all, uh, at that time, I believe they sent your grades to your parents. Yeah. Yes. So uh, they did know what I was taking, and unfortunately, they knew what I was making. <laughs> <laughs> but it all worked out. Okay. And I was an education major, I was a transfer student, so I had few electives. So most of the courses I was taking, I, I had to take at some point. Um, I did have some great electives, but yes, they, they knew all in that regard, probably before we did. Um, yeah, again, my, my mom doesn't really know what I'm taking or what I'm making. Um, that makes it sound like we have an awful relationship, but we don't. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I'll tell her, like, if I'm taking a class that I think she'd be interested in. Um, like, this past semester I took Introduction to Folklore, um, and I thought she would want to know that I was taking that, because we talked about some cool things that might have interest her. Um, but on a semester basis, my mom really has no idea what classes I'm taking, what my grades are. She just kind of trusts that I know what I'm doing and that it'll turn out all right, and if it doesn't, I can contact her. <laughs> Um, my mom really does just because we share the major that my career development family studies major, she majored in child development family studies at ECU. Um, so we talk about those classes a lot. Other than that, I mean, my grades are not tell them what they are, but not, they know that I take courses for my major, and not necessarily talk about my classes. Okay, the next question is about football weekends. What were they like for you? Who did you go with? What did you wear? Uh, what did you do when you got there? So uh, Joanne and Fred, if you'll answer that on this side. And uh, let me make sure I 
uh, be Elizabeth and Lenore, right? Okay. Go ahead, Fred. Uh, football Saturdays here, I remember having Saturday morning class, running back to Craig from main campus, wearing a coat and tie initially as a freshman. And as the years went by, you got less form. <coughs> Um, I, I would initially, I guess I started out going with friends, with roommates, and then later on, got a date, go to the game. Did you have anything in your back pocket? <laughs> no, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> but you can smell it around. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes, um, I had gone to high school that actually didn't have football. I didn't have a clue about how the football game actually went. Uh, but I actually did have some dates on weekends. It, it was as many of you, your class of 69, you know the social structure at the time. And the fact that in our freshman class there were about 300 women and 2,000 men, and the men left on the weekend. <laughs> uh, but yes, I, I did have uh, some, some dates that famous mum uh, cassages as we had. They were in the war. And my daughter, who went here in class of 2001, was in Moorhead, and actually only went for, she said, about 15 minutes of one football game the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I love all things Carolina athletics. So you can probably catch me at whatever sporting event is going on. But I know that football has been increasingly harder to get students to go to, which is sad. Um, hopefully, with the new coaching change, maybe that will attract more students to see Mac Brown, which is exciting. But um, I know that football is exciting for me, and I know it's not exciting for everyone. It gets really hot in that stadium on Saturdays. And also, I know not having like a bunch of night games doesn't bring a lot of students, so like when the games have like a 12 o'clock kickoff, that's also hard to bring students to, because for, you know, 12 o'clock is early for us on the weekend. <laughs> and then, um, but yeah, we just, it's kind of like dress however you want. Um, I know like, at least like in my sorority, like we always like try to find like cute outfits to wear for game day, but um, definitely basketball season is what takes priority here. And like the running joke, which is so sad for football season, has just been like, wait till basketball season. Because that was the running joke. Yeah. Thursday. Like, because obviously we didn't have the best record and our team was the best. But like I said, hopefully that will change in the coming years, which I'm excited about. Um, to add, I'll say that it's typical that students will go to three games. I'm sure that's probably very similar. Um, we, didn't, we don't have Saturday classes, so we can just start early. Um, and people will go to pre games. Um, if it's a new kickoff at like 9, 9.30, really depends on how much you like to drink. Um, I personally could not get myself to a single football game this year, not because of anything other than we just were not great. And, being in that stadium for hours for a team who's lost almost every game was, was difficult. <laughs> Still love my heels, but that's just not our sport. It's, it's okay. um, I think when people typically go, typically go with friends, I, it's less of like a, a date function just because there are tons of restaurants and friends and like coffee and other things that I think people do for first dates. Okay. Charlie Jean, do you remember how you got basketball tickets? Oh, yeah. Jo jo Joanne, do you, does anybody here remember, know how you got basketball tickets? Yeah, in the line, 5 o'clock in the morning. Yeah. Go ahead. Just what they said. I don't, the audience couldn't hear it. You, you, you would stand in line. They had, uh, wasn't really a lottery. You just went, got in line early in the morning if you wanted tickets. And then sometimes you would know people and get tickets that way. Then I remember when we went the, to the NCAA uh, Final Four in the lottery. And uh, I remember particularly during 67, 68, 69, uh, Chapel Hill basketball went to the NCAA Final Four and they had lotteries then. 
who can tell the audience about how you get tickets now? So um, we do a lottery system now. So we all have like one email where all of our emails through UNC come to. And so that's how we like register for our Carolina basketball account. And then you, like I follow it on Twitter. So I follow like Carolina Athletics and they will like post the lotteries open for this game. And so you'll log into your account and you'll enter the lottery and you hope you get the ticket. So then like about three days later, four days later, they send you either your rejection email or your email saying, here are your student tickets. And so for every game except the Duke game, you get two tickets. So that way you can bring a friend. And they're in three different phases. So your first phase, you're like on the risers or the seats right behind that, or the ones right behind the visitor's bench. And then phase two fills in after phase one, and then phase three, you're usually in the nosebleeds. And then for the Duke game, they do five phases. So that's obviously a very competitive game to get tickets to. But um, another really cool thing that we have is Carolina Fever, which is an organization on campus that really promotes getting students to go to other athletic events. So not just men's basketball, because if that were the case, everyone would only go to that. So Carolina Fever really wants people to go to like women's soccer, men's lacrosse, um, other sporting events like that that people typically wouldn't go to. And you get points for going to these games on your UNC One card. And so if you're in the top 150 people who have the most amount of points, you automatically get phase one tickets to every game and you're guaranteed tickets to the Duke game. So that's like a really cool way that they <laughs> So that's a really cool way to like get students incentive to go to other sporting events while also getting to enjoy men's basketball. Okay, I'm gonna break the chain a minute. Any questions about that system? It's so different from what you experienced. What, what do students pay for the tickets? They don't pay, they pay a student fee every semester which includes their health care and library, whatever. And so that's, then, then they have access to any athletic event that we have using what, what she just described was the UNC One card. And they can't scalp the tickets because you have to show your time. Can't, yeah, exactly. Hard to scalp your ticket. You can't scalp your tickets. In a word or two, our biggest rivalry in your mind, and we'll go down this way. Duke. Duke. Duke, Duke, Duke. That was easy. When you were a student. Probably state. Yeah. What? I would say Duke. I would say Duke. Yeah. I think Gina and I both from Raleigh. We would say state because of our friends who a lot of them went state. So it seemed that way. I think it was more mixed between State and Duke in, in, in our time. Okay. Did, did you serve as an intern or have an international experience while you were a student? We'll give everybody a chance on that one. So, did you have an internship at any time and did you have an international experience? I Neither. I, I worked well, some of camp. Went back home and worked. Boy, well, in uh, Hendersonville. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, I was a uh, VS Chem major and actually had an internship the first between freshman and sophomore year with one of my roommates' dad at State, working in research in the forestry department. In between my uh, junior and senior year as an intern at Eli Lilly in uh, Indianapolis. And they were awesomely, uh, basically connected to Carolina. And they made a huge difference in our career. Uh, in the summers I worked, I remember selling dictionaries in Buffalo, New York one summer. <laughs> um, and then one summer I worked in the Johns Manville plant down in Maxson, North Carolina, in Robinson County. And then my senior year, in the spring, I was a legislative intern uh, working for the Speaker of the House in North Carolina General Assembly. So that was the one internship I had during school. I did not have an internship, but I did have some part-time jobs. Um, and one summer, uh, I was able to work 
and just be in Chapel Hill. There were three other gals, um, and I lived on Andrews Lane, which is probably not there anymore, but um, I worked in a little girl shop on Franklin Street, and that was a lot of fun. And I did have some other um, little part-time jobs um, throughout, but for me, there, there were not that many opportunities for international study. I would have loved to have taken a semester abroad or whatever, but there just were not that many opportunities. Right. And being an education major, that was not a draw. Um, so I feel like that now is so very important. And having the opportunity to travel um, after graduation between graduate school is like transformative. And I think everybody should have that opportunity. But for me, it just wasn't as um, available. Um, I would definitely say international travel is such a great opportunity here at Carolina now. I know we have like over 700 programs in all seven continents now, so that's exciting. Uh, I personally haven't studied abroad yet. Um, my major and prerequisites don't really allow me to take a whole semester off, but I do, I hope to take this coming summer after my junior year. Um, each summer they have a UNC professor who teaches biochemistry go to France, and so that's something I would like to do, so that way I can get a prerequisite done, but also get that study abroad experience. And I haven't had an internship. Um, last summer I just went home to Emerald Isle and I worked in Waitress, but um, this summer I get to be in Chapel Hill, which is exciting. I'm doing the summer tour guide program, so I'll be giving tours to prospective high school students, which I'm really excited about because I love that. Um, I have not studied abroad. Um, I don't know if I will. Um, I haven't really decided yet. Um, but during the school year, um, I'm an intern with the Office of University Communications. So we um, run unc.edu. So I write articles for that website. Um, and then we also run UNC social media. So I help um, curate content for um, like UNC's Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, all of those. Um, and I've done that for the past two years, and I'll be continuing next year as well. Um, over the summers, um, this isn't quite an internship, but um, I work for a nonprofit organization called Appalachia Service Project, and we do nonprofit home repair um, throughout central Appalachia in five states. So I actually leave next Friday, and I'll be spending the summer in Washington County, Tennessee, overseeing free home repair um, for citizens of central Appalachia. Um, I haven't held any internships. I had an internship at UNC, but in my time here, I held at least 10 part-time jobs. Um, my record was probably sophomore year. I had four jobs per semester and three second semester. Um, yeah, pretty busy. Um, I studied abroad in the fall semester of this year. Um, from August to December in Cape Town, South Africa. Can you go to that a little bit closer? Yeah. There you I go. studied abroad um, in the fall semester of this year in Cape Town, South Africa, where I had an internship. Um, it was with the Amy Foundation and the um, did after-school programs for the students and their townships. Um, I've done a little bit of both. Um, the summer after my freshman year, I studied abroad in Sevilla, Spain. I took Organic Chemistry 1 with a UNC professor, um, so similar to the program that Elizabeth was talking about earlier. Um, and that was a really great experience. It was six weeks and it was challenging, but I felt like that was probably my favorite of the um, pre-med chemistry sequence um, because it was such a small class. And I got to take a class with a local Sevillan professor in Spanish. I lived with a host family, so I kind of got the best of both worlds um, and had a lot of great experiences there. And Last summer, the summer after my sophomore year, I held an internship at the North Carolina Community Health Center Association, which is based in Raleigh. It's the primary care association for the state that manages all 49 <coughs> community health centers, which are um, a safety net resource for people who wouldn't have health care otherwise. This upcoming summer, I'll be holding an internship at Accenture, which is a consulting firm. I'll be working in the Raleigh office, probably on the Medicaid transformation for the state. Thank you. You see any differences? <laughs> Anybody here know, remember how you registered? You actually registered for courses and then something called drop ad that they don't know what that is? But do you remember any of that? Uh, registration. Hold it up here, Fred. Registration was sort of a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> you stood in long lines at 
Will and Jim. And you hope by the time you got to the front, you there was a key punch card available for that class you wanted. What else? Uh, That's right. Hi, drop ad? Drop ad. Uh, same thing, I think. For a certain number, does anybody else remember? I won't chime in. Go ahead, Joe. Yeah, when we were standing, someone mentioned this on uh, Thursday when we were picking up our registration and we were standing in a line that we said it reminded us of registration <laughs> for classes because the lines would, would be incredible. When you get to the front, the course that you wanted was in gone, and you have to start all over again. That's right. And then the other thing about drop ad, you had, as I recall, a certain number of weeks, and so you had to drop the course or add the course within that period of time. And then if you were going to add it, you remember how you got that card? You had to go to the department and get that card and take that card to the Office of Registration, Records and Registration. If they didn't have the card, you didn't get in the class. So how do y'all register? It's all online now. <laughs> I, I know I have a lot of people in my family who have gone to UNC and they told me that they basically had to drop the card to drop their class. Um, I just press a button on Connect Carolina <laughs> drop class and then I enroll. You can actually swap, it's really nice. So you don't have to go back and wait in line for another class. You can do this function where you swap classes. So you simultaneously drop a class and add another one so that if you don't get into the new one, you're still in the old one. Ooh. So it's a nice feature. Um, they tell you how to use that at orientation. And it's still a pain. Um, you still don't get all the classes you want to get right off the bat. You have to be really prepared with backup plans and other classes to fill your schedule. But typically, I mean, it all works out. You know. Stay with that just a minute. So do you, are you assigned an hour on a certain day? How, how does yes. that work? That's, so that's determined, it's honestly, like a lottery of times, so you won't necessarily get a great time every semester unless you have some sort of ARS, um, you know, condition that will allow you to get 8 a.m. Um, but they range. I think it's every 15 minutes or every 30 minutes from 8 a.m. to I don't know, it's like four. three or four. Um, and if you get a time that's honestly after like 10, classes are already closed. Um, so you'll have to you see that little blue square. And that's like a little blue square of death, which means that the class is already closed and you can't get in it. Um, but you know, usually you select all the classes that are in your shopping cart at once that you want to enroll in. You click enroll, then there's like this whole validation screen that's like, are you sure that these are the classes that you want? You click yes, and then it'll give you kind of a list of did those classes work, yes or no. You'll either see a red X if you didn't get in, or a green circle if you. I can tell you this, they were a whole lot better with those cards. They would never have been able to do that. You couldn't have managed that. Anybody else want to add anything about registration? Go ahead. We also like have the option to waitlist classes, which is really nice. So um, like if you did get into a class, certain classes will have like a waitlist of 10 people that you can put yourself on. So um, like if it's a prereq class or like a class that requires a prereq, but people didn't get the grade needed or something, they'll end up dropping the class, or if they just don't need that class anymore, they'll drop, and you'll move up the wait list. And then you usually, like, especially if you need the class, you keep checking like every day to see if you've gotten in. Um, we also have like this really cool app that I frequently use called Coursicle, and so you can um, like track your classes. It's like specifically got designed for UNC, so you just like type in the class name, and it'll tell you like, the status of the class. So if you're trying to like get on a wait list or get into the class, like you'll get a notification on your cell phone that says this class just opened. So you like log into your Connect Carolina really fast and try to enroll in it before someone else can. It's like the Hunger Games <laughs> registration. But yeah. Okay. Joanne has some. One of the things that, that uh, I think Carolina scored really high on was having course availability because not having course availability was one of the things that caused people to be in college for greater than five years because they couldn't get, because right. it's a five-year mark is where uh, universities are graded on, and a lot of times that was not making courses available and attracting popular courses, opening more sessions. And so I 
think it's like kudos to Caroline and probably having these systems like you've got. It's like awesome. All right, this is the uh, last question for the panel, and then we'll, we'll throw it up. Your favorite professor and why? So, Jean, we'll start with you on that. Actually, when I was thinking about this, I, I had three. Good. Um, the first one is Dr. Kenneth Redford. Um, he was teaching a classics course that I was able to get into, and it was really wonderful because it was outside my major, and I got to see other people in the class. But the one thing he did that I, I enjoy thinking about is he wanted us always to take a record walk when we had the time to do so, and that is to enjoy this beautiful campus, um, immerse ourselves in what we were reading, or what we wanted to think about and reflect. So take this valuable time and stroll and think and just value the time you have with this course. And I thought, well, that was kind of weird at first, but then when you started sort of doing it on purpose, it was like, great. And my best buddy and I walk campus every Saturday, and even though we may not officially have our Redford walk, we do what he would like us to do. And I think that was really wonderful. The second was Mary Turner Lane, who was in education. Right. And I felt like she was the steel magnolia. Um, she was elegant, she was accomplished, but she was also one of the best methods person, uh, teachers I had. And then um, the last one was um, a religion professor. I was never able to get into a Dr. Boyd class, but I signed up and got, um, I think his name is Chris at Dr. Hill. Sam Hill, actually. Sam. He was wonderful and just um, allowed me to uh, learn about things I had never thought about before in terms of various religions, how they were the same, how they were different. It was just a very enriching class. and. So I think, um, although I loved my major and I loved what I ended up doing in my life, it was all of those rich liberal arts classes that I just absolutely loved. So, and Dr. Reckford, um, his, his son is the commencement speaker today. So that's pretty interesting. Well, we, we've, those are three of the most respected professors we've, we've ever had, and Dr. Redford walked that walk just about every day. You would see him around campus. Uh, one professor I remember was uh, Bill Gear, uh, <laughs> Modern Mercedes. Civilization. Uh, Did you get the Red Bull? I don't recall. Oh, good. <laughs> uh, you know what I'm talking about? It, 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 for Dr. Gear, who later became director of financial aid here, if if you wrote, uh, you know, in response to a quiz or an exam, if he thought it was bull. He had a stamp. It was red, and that's what he would stamp on your blue book. That I thought it was Bill. <laughs> I thought it was Bill. Bill here, so I knew what we were talking about. Uh, I thought he was an exceptional lecturer, yeah. and even though it was a large class, a lecture class, Bill Gear cared about the students. Uh, he kept up with the students, and I always had a great deal of respect for particularly being in such a large class. And then another uh, professor I had in political science later was C.B. Robeson. Hmm. And I had him, I think it was some British politics course and another course. Uh, and he also was very good, he had great depth of knowledge, also was a caring professor, uh, and uh, always available to discuss things. So reached out to students as well. Thank you. Bill Gear stood in front. I had that second Modern Civ II or whatever it was, and he, uh, like, I don't know, the third session, he said, Ulysses Grant was a, was a better general than Robert E. Lee. And of course, the whole class went, you know, and he said, somebody said, why do you, what do you base that on? Who won? <laughs> I also remember Bill here, and I was amazed that he did really know students because I came back on campus many, many years later, and he said, you were in my class, weren't you? And I'm going, uh, yeah, <laughs> I was. But one of my favorite professors, I was a BS chem major, was Dave Witten. He was a professor here for a number of years, and 
he took a very personal interest in the, there were only a few students that would be as STEM majors, but in my year, there were four women out of 40, and uh, three of us, we were able to do a special uh, course in organic chemistry with him. And he also took, for me personally, a, a, an extra step in nominating me for some things that typically uh -huh. African American women do not be nominated for, including the Valkyries, and he marshaled through. And it was one of the first times that I had somebody who wasn't a personal friend or anything that took such an interest in, in me personally. Also, uh, there was one other professor of population genetics, and I, uh, I block on the name, but it was an awesome course as a science major, you don't get many electives, and that was one of the ones I had chose, and it was just, it was eye-opening for me, because I had not thought about those kinds of things. And Bill Beer's thing about who won, the interesting thing for me is my youngest daughter's um, husband is a great, great grandson of Stone and Jess. <laughs> Fred? I would say my favorite professor was, uh, history professor, Dr. Herbert Bodman. He made the Middle East come alive. I mean, it was um, quite fascinating. He, he's, one thing I particularly remember, he was a stickler for geography. We would have every test, you would have a map, and he'd have lists of places, and he said, put them where they're supposed to be. And if you didn't get it right, <laughs> But uh, he, he was always a, a real dapper uh, of a dresser. <coughs> and he looked like a college professor. Yeah, he did. And that image always stuck with me. And, uh, as well as the geography lessons. It came in very handy later on when I was involved with Desert Shield and Desert Storm many years later. The name he said was Herbert Bodman. I don't know if, if you heard that, but he was the advisor to St. Anthony Hall. Yeah. And I, and I worked a lot with him, and he was a tremendous supporter of women's basketball. Here he was almost always at the women's basketball games. A wonderful guy. Yeah. Good friend. And quite a sailor, too. He I did sail not. Every summer to Europe. I did not know that part. Favorite professor, and why? Um. <coughs> I too, but my my favorite professor probably of all time would be Dr. Benjamin Meyer. He is in the public policy department. Um, he's also appointed uh, in the School of Public Health. I took a class with him called Health and Human Rights. Um, it's a 500 level class, so it's kind of grad students and undergrads, and I took it as a sophomore, so I was incredibly intimidated. Um, but I think it was a class that really challenged everything that I thought I knew about healthcare and made me look um, at those topics from a different perspective. And I really appreciated that because I felt like that was one of the classes that has defined my college experience and has done what I expected UNC to do for me, which is to challenge everything that I thought I knew and push me further than I thought I could go. Um, the second professor is my finance professor, my healthcare finance professor, Dr. Kristen Reyer. Um, I just have to mention her because she's a wonderful teacher. Um, I think she cares a lot about her students, she cares a lot about our successes, and that is reinforced by everything she does and everything she says. Um, so I think those two people have had a Thank you. <coughs> um, my favorite professor that I've had thus far um, is Professor Ronald Williams. He's a professor in the AAA department. Um, I've taken two classes with him. One, oh, sorry, um, African American, or African African American DS for studies. Um, and I take two classes with him, one my first year. Nobody told me that you're not supposed to sign up for 300 level classes first year, so that was a great time. Um, <laughs> but basically, he's my favorite professor because I'm from Washington, North Carolina. Like I said, a very small town, very country town here in the East Coast or on the East Coast. Um, and it's kind of like a little bubble. There's not that much that I knew until I took that class um, regarding my race um, and people that look like me. So it basically taught me everything I know about the concept of race and intersectionality, which is really cool. Um, but I do want to reiterate, too, that even though I've had professors that I really enjoy um, for me, and I know a lot of my friends and, and a lot of other students, it's more so, and I don't know if it was like this in 1969, the staff around campus and various departments that I have very, very good relationships with. 
Um, Joaquin is one of my favorite professors. Most of the people that I care about the most that aren't students are my community director that I work with or the people that I've worked with, worked with in various offices around campus. Um, so they have more so have an impact on my life than my professors have. Hmm. Um, I have three, but I'll try to keep them brief. Uh, my first one is History 120, which I took with um, Dr. Matthew Andrews, I think it's his name. Um, and that is Sports and American History. Um, I took that my first semester here, and somehow, I, as a freshman, I got in. Like, normally, they fill, like, his classes fill up within the first day of registration because they're that popular. Um, he is just a fantastic lecturer. He is consistently voted one of, if not the best professors at Carolina. Um, and just the way that he, I mean, I'm really not that into sports. I mean, I like going to basketball games, but I mean, he really talks about how political sports really are. Um, and it really opened my eyes and I just, he is a fantastic, fantastic lecturer and I've really never looked at sports the same way since then. Um, and next, my other one is um, a first year seminar I took um, with an adjunct professor. Um, named J.D. Buxton, um, and that was about education policy. Um, at one time I thought I wanted to go into education policy. Um, but he really, um, first year seminars are small classes, um, and so he really took the time, um, he really complimented my writing, um, and he really gave me the confidence to pursue journalism once I figured out that I didn't want to do education policy. Um, but he was giving me very high compliments for my writing and really took the time to talk with me one-on-one -on -one and told me to do something with my ability to write, which I appreciate. Um, my last one, which is a class I took because I figured out I was a good writer, um, was uh, Mijo 153, which is writing and reporting in the journalism school. Um, and most people in the journalism school would tell you that's their least favorite class. It's not a very popular one. Um, but my professor, her name is, uh, her name is Kate Shepard. Uh, she is a senior enterprise editor at the Huffington Post. Um, which was just amazing. Like as a first year student here, being able to have a professor who still works at the Huffington Post and was able to connect us with real life journalists who are tackling like today's issues was just outstanding. Um, and I really appreciate that the journalism school values professors who are still practicing journalism. And it was a really, really valuable experience for me to have as a first year journalism student. I would say that I have two favorite professors. Um, the first one I had this past semester, his name is Dr. Anthony Hackney. Um, he was my physiology teacher. And when I tell you before I started this class, I was terrified of this man. Um, we have this website called Rate My Professors where students can like go and rate the professor of that class. So like as you're registering for classes, if you're like on the fence about one or two, you can see like who the better professor is. And he had horrible reviews, horrible. Like one star, like do not take this class with him. He is so bad, so mean. And I was like, okay. So then I ended up loving him. He was definitely so hard on us. I know a lot of people might not respond to that very well, but for me, it made me want to work harder. Um, he truly wanted the best for his students and I loved him. Like he was an amazing lecturer. He truly cared about physiology. And he was the first person who really made me sit back and realize that, you know, I'm at a really prestigious university. People dream about coming here because he actually had to take a week off during the semester I took with him to go to Switzerland because he's on the IAAF board, which if you have kept up with the news at all, um Casper Semenya, she was fighting this case um, basically about her hormone levels and um, whether or not the, her amount of testosterone would allow her to race as a woman in the Olympics. And so he was actually on her case. Like he was fighting for her on her legal team. And so when he left for that, he like couldn't tell us the details about the case until he came back and all the deliberation was over. But that just really made me realize like this is an important man. Um, I'm learning from someone who is the best of the best in the physiology world. And so hormones are just fascinating to me. So that was also another way that like I really connected with him, which is awesome. And then my second professor is Eric Sampson. I think he was a graduate student when he was teaching. Um, it was my fall semester of sophomore year. But um, he taught ethics of peace, war, and fence, which 
I had never taken ethic, an ethics class before, and I was really taking a class just to fill a general education requirement. Um, so I was like, let's just get it over with. Um, but like, I come from a military town. I live right next to Camp Lejeune. And so my whole life, like all my friends were military. And so this class like really opened my eyes to like actually debating like the ethics of like terrorism, um, um, like anything about war, drone warfare, things like that. And he really like allowed us to think and actually like talk out our feelings, which I had never really had a class like that before because I'm a STEM major. So you know what's right is right and what's wrong is wrong. <laughs> and so. Um, like during class, he would really like leave it up to us for discussion. Like he would of course lead us through everything, and I could go to his office hours and talk about like what I was thinking for like exam answers. And you know he would kind of like say like yes, like you're right in this sense, but you need to be able to back up your point. And so like that's kind of like applied to my future classes after that. Like you always have to have a counter analysis for the arguments you're making. You have to be able to see where other people are coming from on different sides of arguments but also be able to back up your own argument. So I really enjoyed that class. Okay, thank you. All right, we've got a few minutes for questions from the audience for anybody on the panel. John? Joanne, <laughs> tell us what it was like as a young African-American female back in the 60s coming to Carolina. I, I, I was sitting here trying to remember the number of African-American friends I had, and I had some of just it was very small presence on me. Well, that's so, so the question is to ask Joanne what it was like as an African-American woman here on campus and that there, there were so few uh, in that time. There were indeed so few. <laughs> as a matter of fact, when we started, there were two. Oh, wow. Yeah, out of the whole class. Me uh, uh, and Laverla Peace Vaughn. Laverla uh, was from Chapel Hill. And her dad was principal of the high school in town. And so uh, I was uh, in, and Cobb dorm was the dorm, because it was the first year they admitted freshman women. So there were very few <coughs> women, period. Uh, and the number, I think there were maybe four African-American men, and they were all on the North Campus, the <coughs> dorms. So it was, it was really fairly daunting in a way for me, it was not as daunting as it would have been for some other kids because I was one of those people, I went to parochial school for all of my education in Raleigh. So all of my teachers were nuns from the Northeast. And um, my high school class, there were 32 people, five were African American, and we'd all gone to school from St. Monica's through Carmel Gibbons. And Jean was in uh, freshman and sophomore class. So this is ironic that you'd have two people who went to Cardinal Gibbon for more than high and all. <laughs> class size 32. Uh, but yeah, it, it, was, it was really fairly difficult because I, you know, I had been at the top of my class there. So I was one of these people that's like a can-do person, so you can do it. And so I did like crazy things. Like when they had sorority rush, I actually went out. I mean, that was like silly <laughs> because it was like an ice cream chance and you know what? <laughs> and I went to the fraternity mixer <laughs> also, you know, but I just like, you know, what else was there to do? There wasn't anything else to do, so you do it what's available. But one of the things that, that was um, excellent was that I had uh, subsequently two great freshman roommates that are, one of them is still my friend now, Kathy Zobel, who's with us back the other way to leave. And so 50 years later, we're exchanging cards, and her dad was one who, gave, who was a professor at state and gave him a job. So it, it was very difficult, but ultimately, I met my husband, who was a year behind me, is from Chapel Hill, whose majority, uh, I would say, majority Caucasian, whatever. <laughs> and uh, we've been married now, it'll be our, we'll celebrate our 50th wedding anniversary in August. Um, and um, ended up coming back here. His family was uh, very accepting, and many of the people were. I mean, there were some really missteps, and I think the university has tried to deal with these kinds of things. For instance, my freshman year, my roommate initially was a, a singer, which was unique. She had, like, missed, but she was Jewish, and when her parents found that she was 
uh, Rumi was an African American, they did not object to that, but they objected to the fact that the university had decided that the one Jewish woman and the one African American woman should be. <laughs> 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 I mean, and they, I think they hadn't really talked to a lot of the other freshmen that were, because Kathy was a year ahead of us. She'd been a nanny in France, and her parents were, um, did, were um, second generation U.S. They were originally from the Netherlands. Scandinavia, but you know, it was like those the parents would not have objected, but I think just the assumption. And the other funny, funny story I tell quite frequently was at the end of my first semester, I got called into the Dean of Women. That you, I mean, I think many of us here now, and the students now don't have this house mothers, um, and the, they're a Dean of Women students specifically. And she called me in to add. I think she just wanted to see me or something. I went, I went, she she saw all she yeah. saw almost all the women who yeah. were here. Yeah. Was, but I was so stupid. She asked me if I was working too hard, and I said, "No, ma'am, <laughs> I'm not." And she she didn't understand why my grades were so good because from <laughs> Carolina, I mean, coming to Carolina from a small school like that, they project you just barely getting by, and I was doing better than just getting by. And she, I mean, I said, well, ma'am, you know, I'm not fixing dinner for the six younger kids. I'm not working 16 hours a week on the weekend at the, my cousin's restaurant, so I've got a lot of extra time. <laughs> but, I mean, I, I see uh, that this was, even though there were these uh, challenges for me and for many of us, most of the African Americans who felt that it was worth it for the education and I think for the price that we had to pay, because I was able to finish Carolina between working and scholarships, summer internships, so with no debt. I mean, and that's not something very many people get to do. I mean, you have to scrimp and save and so forth. But I knew that I wanted to go to medical school, so in order to guarantee that I could possibly do that, at least I thought at the time, then I thought that I had to uh, get through without debt. My initial go. Uh, deal was I was going to join the military, my dad told me I couldn't. I was going to join the Navy and go to medical school that way, but <laughs> that wasn't something that was going to allow. But, but it, was, it, was, it was difficult, but it was, you know, it was doable. And, and I'm happy to see that it's changed, but I think I told someone yesterday that I wanted it to have changed more than it's changed, because my, my daughter, is class of 2001. She was a Moorhead scholar here at Carolina, so she came in a very different way than I did. But still, there were so many, still challenges for her. And even now, when I look at various things that have happened on campuses, up here in Duke, I'm very involved in Duke, obviously, faculty there for 32 years, that there are things that you just think 50 years ago. I would I would project it that they would be fixed now, <laughs> and they're not. And so we have a lot of work to do, but it still is an awesome university. I mean, again, the commitment that uh, the state has made and all of us continue to make is really phenomenal. Thank you, and and thanks for coming back then and helping <laughs> university get it right. Has it changed? How? What's it like? <laughs> um, well, the first thing I was going to say is that the numbers haven't increased um, as much as they maybe should have. I will say that now colleges as a whole, and UNC for sure, the ratio of women to men is 60 to 40. Um, so there's a lot more women here. Um, but when you look at like that data stratified by race, that those numbers haven't really increased. I know in the class of, like, I believe it was 2016, there were 96 black men to graduate from the university um, and of a class of 4,000. Um, I personally just think to be in 2016, 96 black men of a class of 4,000 is insane, it's ridiculous. Um, so the numbers haven't really changed. I will say that my personal experience has been one that I think is similar to yours and that I came from a high school where I felt prepared to compete in an environment where I was the only one or one of few. And I have never, given that a second thought because that is how I was raised and growing up in Chapel Hill I felt very prepared for this experience but there have been like microaggressions or instances where I felt that you know 
people don't realize or recognize their unconscious biases, and they then project that onto me and my experience. And because of how I was raised and who I am, I, you know, just kind of let that roll off. Or, you know, if I feel like I need to say something, I'll stand up. There was an incident with a professor in my freshman year where he made a comment or insinuated that, you know, my experience would, couldn't possibly have happened because of my race. And I, you know, went to office hours and talked to him about that because I felt like that was an opportunity where I could stand up for myself and say, no, that's actually not what my personal experience has been. And I really don't appreciate that you made that assumption based on what I look like to you. Um, but beyond that, I, I, so I would say the environment has changed such that I feel comfortable and safe in, in speaking up for myself and, and asserting um, what I feel like is, you know, the fact that I should have the same access to opportunities that anyone else on this campus has because I did the work to get in here and I'm doing the work to be here. Um, but I will say that overall, the change hasn't been as fast as probably it should have been. Uh, but students are still working every day. Thank you. I wish we had more time, but, but we don't. Doug, thank, uh, Cliff, I can't, I've got to turn it over. <laughs> Doug, thank you and your staff for making this possible. Don't we have some very impressive people up here? Thank you all, you were great, I appreciate it.